in your lifetime, will we be able to build an AI system that's able to replace me as the interviewer in this conversation in terms of ability to ask questions that are compelling to somebody listening? And then further question is, are we close? Will we be able to build a system that replaces you as the interviewee in order to create a compelling conversation where this podcast, sort of the fourth or the fifth time we talk on this podcast, both of us will be uh, replaced by AI agents for, that represents our viewpoints. How far away are we, do you think? It's a good question. Um, I think partly I would say, do we want that? I I really like when we start now with very powerful models, interacting with them and thinking of them more closer to us. The question is, if you remove the human side of the conversation, is that an interesting, you know, is that an interesting artifact? And I would say probably not. I've seen, for instance, um, last time we spoke, like was we were talking about StarCraft um, and creating, you know, agents that play games involves self-play. But ultimately, what people care about was how does this agent behave when the opposite side is is a human. So, without a doubt, we will probably be more empowered by AI. Um, maybe you can source some questions from an AI system. I mean, that even today, I would say it's quite plausible that with your creativity, you might actually find very interesting questions that you can filter. Um, we call this cherry picking sometimes in the field of language. Um, and likewise, if I had now the tools on my side, I could say, look, you're asking this interesting question. From this answer, I like the words chosen by this particular system that created a few words. Completely replacing it feels not exactly exciting to me. Um, although in my lifetime, I think way, I mean, given the trajectory, I think it's possible that perhaps there could be interesting, um, maybe self-play interviews, as you, you're suggesting, that would look look or sound quite interesting and probably would educate or you could learn a topic through listening to one of these interviews at, at a basic level, at least. So you said it doesn't seem exciting to you, but what if exciting is part of the objective function the thing is optimized over? So you can, there's probably a huge amount of data of humans, if you look correctly, of humans communicating online, and there's probably ways to measure the degree of you know, as it, they talk about engagement. So you can probably optimize the question that's most created an engaging conversation in the past. So actually, if you strictly use the word exciting, uh, there is probably a way to create a optimally exciting conversations that are involve AI systems. At least one side is AI. Yeah, that makes sense. I think maybe looping back a bit to, to games and the game industry, when you design algorithms, um, you're thinking about winning as the objective, right? Or the reward function. But in fact, when we discussed this with Blizzard, the creators of StarCraft in this case, I think what's exciting, fun, um, if you could measure that and optimize for that, that's probably why we play video games or why we interact or listen or look at cat videos or whatever on the internet. So it's true that modeling reward beyond the obvious reward functions we've used to in reinforcement learning is definitely very exciting. And again, there is some progress actually into um, a particular aspect of AI, which is quite critical, which is, um, for instance, is a conversation that, or is the information truthful, right? So you could start trying to evaluate um, these from um, excerpts from the internet, right? That has lots of information. And then if you can learn a function automated, ideally, so you can also optimize it more easily, um, then you could actually have conversations that optimize for non-obvious things such as excitement. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's quite possible. And then I would say in that case, it would definitely be fun, a fun exercise and quite unique to have at least one site that is fully driven by um, an excitement reward function. Um, but obviously, there would be still quite a lot of humanity in the system, both from who are, who is building the system, of course, and also um, ultimately, if we think of labeling for excitement, that those labels must come from us because it's just hard to have a computational measure of excitement. As far as I understand, there's no such thing. Well, oof. <laughs> so you mentioned truth also. I would actually 
venture to say that excitement is easier to label than truth, or is perhaps uh, has lower consequences of, of failure. Uh, but there is perhaps the the humanness that you mentioned. That's perhaps part of a thing that could be labeled, and that could mean an AI system that's doing dialogue, that's doing conversations, should be flawed, for example. Like that's the thing you optimize for, which is uh, have inherent contradictions by design, have flaws by design. Maybe it also needs to have a strong sense of identity. So it has a backstory it told itself that it sticks to. It has memories, not in terms of the how the system is designed, but it's able to tell stories about its past. It's able to have um, mortality and fear of mortality in the following way that it has an identity. And like, if it says something stupid and gets canceled on Twitter, that's the end of that system. So it's not like you get to rebrand yourself. That system is, that's it. So maybe that, the the high stakes nature of it, because like, you can't say anything stupid now, or, or because uh, you'd be canceled on Twitter. And that there's there's stakes to that. And that I think part of the reason that makes it uh, interesting. And then you have a perspective like you've built up over time that you stick with and then people can disagree with you. So holding that perspective strongly, holding sort of a, maybe a controversial, at least a, a strong opinion, all of those elements, it feels like they can be learned because it feels like there's a lot of data on the internet of people having an opinion. <laughs> and then combine that with a metric of excitement, you can start to create something that, as opposed to trying to optimize for uh, sort of grammatical clarity and truthfulness, the the factual uh, consistency over many sentences, you optimize for uh, the humanness. And there's obviously data for humanness on the internet. So I wonder, I wonder if there's a future where that's part, or I mean, I, I, I sometimes wonder that about myself. I'm a huge fan of podcasts and I listen to pod, some podcasts and I think like, what is interesting about this? What is compelling? Uh, the same way you watch other games, like you said, watch play StarCraft or uh, have Magnus Carlsen play chess. So I'm not a chess player, so but it's still interesting to me. And what is that? That's the... Uh, the stakes of it, maybe um, the end of a domination of a series of wins. I don't know. There's all those elements somehow connect to a compelling conversation. And I wonder how hard is that to replace? Because ultimately, all of that connects to the initial proposition of how to test whether an AI is intelligent or not with the Turing test, uh, which I guess the, my question comes from a place of the spirit of that test. Yes, um, I actually recall I was just listening to our uh, first podcast where we discussed Turing test. Um, so I would say from a neural network, you know, AI builder um, perspective, um, there's, you know, usually you try to map many of these interesting topics you discuss to, to benchmarks and then also to actual architectures on the how these systems are currently built, how they learn, what data they learn from, what are they learning, right? We're talking about weights of a mathematical function. And then looking at the current state uh, of the game, maybe what do we need leaps forward to get to the ultimate stage of all these experiences, um, lifetime experience, uh, fears, like words that currently barely we're, we're seeing um, progress just because what's happening today is you take um, all these human interactions, um, it's a large vast uh, of variety of, of human interactions online, and then you're distilling these sequences, right? Going back to my passion, like sequences of words, letters, um, images, sound, there's more modalities here to be, to be at play. And then you're trying to just learn a function that will be happy, that maximizes the, the likelihood of seeing all these um, through a neural network. Um, now, I think there's a few places where the way currently we train these models would clearly like to be able to develop the kinds of capabilities you say. I'll tell you maybe a couple. One is the lifetime of an agent or a model. Uh, so you you learn from this data offline, right? So you're just passively observing and maximizing these, you know, it's almost like a mountain 
like a, a, sca a landscape of mountains. And then everywhere there's data that humans interacted in this way. You're trying to make that higher and then you know lower where there's no data. And then these models generally don't then experience themselves. These they just are observers, right? They're mm -hmm. passive observers of the data. And then we're putting them to then generate data when we interact with them. But that's very limiting. The experience they actually experience um, when they could maybe be optimizing or further optimizing the weights, we're not even doing that. So to be clear, and again, mapping to AlphaGo, AlphaStar, we train the model. And when we deploy it um, to play against humans, or in this case, interact with humans, um, like language models, they don't even keep training, right? They're not learning in the sense of the weights that you've learned from the data, they don't keep changing. Now, there's something a bit more, feels magical, but it's understandable if you're into neural net, which is, well, they might not learn in the strict sense of the words, the weights changing, maybe that's mapping to how neurons interconnect and how we learn over our lifetime. But it's true that the context of the conversation that they they that takes that takes place with when you talk to these systems, it's held in their working memory, right? It's almost like um, you start a computer; it has a hard drive that has a lot of information. You have access to the internet, which has probably all the information. But it, there's also a working memory where the these agents, as we call them or start calling them, build upon. Now, these memory is very limited. Um, I mean, right now we're talking, to be concrete, about 2,000 words that we hold, and then beyond that, we start forgetting what we've seen. So you can see that there's some short-term coherence already, right, with when you said, I mean, it's a very interesting topic, um, having sort of a mapping um, an agent to, like, have consistency, then, you know, if, if, if you say, oh, what's your name, um, it could remember that, but then it might forget beyond 2,000 words, which is not that long of context, if we think even of these podcast um, books uh, are much longer. So technically speaking, there's a limitation there. Super exciting from people that work on deep learning to be working on. Uh, but I would say we lack maybe benchmarks and the technology to have this lifetime-like experience of memory that keeps building up. Um, however, the way it learns offline is clearly very powerful, right? So. I, you know, you asked me three years ago, I would say, oh, we're very far. I think we've seen the power of this imitation again uh, on the internet scale that has enabled this um, to feel like at least the knowledge, the basic knowledge about the world now is incorporated into the weights. Uh, but then this experience is lacking. And in fact, as I said, we don't even train them when, you know, when we're talking to them other than their working memory, of course is affected. So that's the dynamic part, but they don't learn in the same way that you and I have learned, right? When, from basically when we were born and probably before. Uh, so lots of fascinating, interesting questions you asked there. I think um, the one I mentioned is this idea of memory and experience versus just kind of observe the world and learn its knowledge, which I think for that, I would argue lots of recent advancements that make me very excited about the field. And then the second maybe issue that I see is all these models, we train them from scratch. That's something I would have complained three years ago or six years ago or 10 years ago. And it feels if we take inspiration from how we got here, how the universe evolved us um, and we keep evolving, it feels that is a missing piece, that we should not be training models from scratch. Um, every few months, that there should be some sort of way in which we can grow models, um, much like as a species and many other elements in the universe is building from the previous sort of iterations. And that, from a just purely neural network perspective, even though we, we, we would like to make it work, it's proven very hard to not you know, throw away the previous weights, right? This landscape we learn from the data and, you know, refresh it with a brand new set of weights, um, given maybe a recent snapshot of these data sets we train on, et cetera, or even a new game we're learning. So that's that feels like something is missing fundamentally. We might find it, but it's not very clear how it will look like. There's many ideas and it's super exciting as well.